The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and drama. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Kakuna Karina, who's the president and CEO of the famous Harlem School of the Arts. Glad to have you with you, Kakuna. Thank you so much for inviting us on. The Harlem School of Arts is kind of legendary. It was founded by the wonderful black opera singer Dorothy Mayner. Tell us about how they got started, what process it went through to get to where it is now with that beautiful theater you have on St. Nicholas Avenue in Harlem. Well, uh, Dorothy Maynard was a one, not just a visionary, but she was really a true force of nature. She's a woman who could not perform on a lot of the stages mm -hmm. here in the United States and became an internationally acclaimed And that's because of racism, racism at that absolutely. time. Absolutely. And um, you know, became in internationally renowned as a singer. She performed, I believe, at two, maybe three presidential inaugurations. Mm -hmm. And um, just ironically, and, and of course, uh, to be expected from someone like her, uh, ultimately became the first African-American board member at the Metropolitan Opera, where she hadn't been able to sing um, mm -hmm. during the height of her career. Uh, she founded the Harlem School of the Arts in the basement of St. James Church on At the corner. Of, that's right. In St. Nicholas Avenue. Avenue. Her husband was the, was the reverend there. And she started with 12 students teaching piano. Mm -hmm. and, and What year was that? Well, it was 45 years ago this year. So just imagine. Yeah. And uh, there she started, but she certainly didn't stop there. Mm -hmm. um, within, within, in no short order, uh, she acquired the land adjacent to St. James Church. And if anyone who's familiar with the, uh, with the neighborhood will know that we are just adjacent to the church, but we're also across the street from Benta's. Um, so it's a very active uh, corner there at 141st and St. Nicholas, which she acquired uh, old warehouses and parking garages that there's still some remnants of that on the mm -hmm. block between 141st and 145th Street and um, and this community theater that was just smack in the middle of of uh, an industrial area really uh, she managed to raise the money she brought in Ulrich Franzen who was an Austrian architect and who created an award-winning design and award-winning facility uh, which we still occupy today and which was which was built on a model of multidisciplinary arts instruction, which was very uh, unique at that time for a community-based arts organization. Being that she was from the music world, one would have expected that she would have focused on music. But she, we, we offer not just music, we also offer dance, theater, and visual arts. Now, so, why did she decide to do that? Because I, I, I knew her and her husband. And I know when they started this, and I thought it was really going to be for, for music. And then all of a sudden I find that they're doing art, they're doing dance, they're doing drama. Uh, what was her vision behind doing that? I, I, I think that she truly believed that um, uh, as broad an exposure as possible to the arts for a child um, would guarantee a, a future. This is, this is someone who created this institution, which by the way, she raised all the money and she paid it back in three years, not like today's generations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, she felt very, very strongly that the children of Harlem deserved and should have exposure to the arts. She knew what a difference it made in her life and in the lives of the few other African-American artists of, of renown, such as herself. And um, she was committed to creating beauty in the community of Harlem at a time when very few people thought that there was much that was beautiful in that community. Um, she absolutely has been proven right. Um, the Harlem School of the Arts today is still one of only a few multidisciplinary community-based arts institutions of its type. Most are single discipline or two discipline at, you know, at the most. But she, the, what Harlem School of the Arts offers to a child is um, an opportunity to have a broad exposure, which really helps in preparing them for life, um, rather than narrowing down their thought process. Well, that's an interesting point, because we know the famous dance theater of Harlem, mm -hmm. and uh, the group with Rosa Rivers, the repertory theater, and so on, they do focus narrowly on those things. Now, when your participants come, 
Does everybody have to participate in every segment of the arts? Absolutely not. I mean, she, I think Dorothy Maynard's focus was on arts education, mm, uh, that's and that's really the, the difference between uh, um, the Harlem School of the Arts and other arts institutions in our community, which are single discipline in mm. focus. And in that regard, uh, we also founded a program, uh, Opportunities for Learning in the Arts, in 1977, when the arts funding was first cut from the New York City public school system. And uh, as a result of that program, the Harlem School of the Arts has provided arts, arts programming to an average of about 15 or 16 public schools annually. This is a program that continues. In the Harlem community. Uh, Harlem, Upper Manhattan, and the Bronx, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a program that we continue to this day, which is actually needed more today, I think, now mm -hmm. that we're facing a similar situation as what uh, Ms. Maynard had faced and, and uh, Betty Allen, who succeeded her. Uh, but to go back to really how the institution fo was founded, I think her vision was not just uh, families and children. It was also to, the Harlem School of the Arts has been an incubator for other arts and cultural mm -hmm. organizations, and I think that's very, very important because you mentioned Dance Theater of Harlem. Well, Dance Theater of Harlem started at the Harlem School mm -hmm. of the Arts in those dance studios. That's where Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell really brought together and mm -hmm. created his institution. Um, the Harlem Arts Alliance, I believe, started mm -hmm. at the uh, Harlem School of the Arts before it also stepped out into its own. The Children's Arts Carnival, which mm -hmm. is now right behind us on, ha on Hamilton Terrace, mm -hmm. and which has been there for over 40 years, uh, also started at the Harlem School of the Arts. And that's a tradition that we've really brought back to the fore, I'd say, in the last few years as artists and arts groups in our community have begun facing just extreme challenges um, and, and primarily driven by real estate development mm -hmm. <clears throat> because they can't now, they can no longer afford to be in the community and then of course secondarily but not necessarily of, of secondary importance by economic uh, challenges that are far more severe today. What about the cultural traditions behind the arts that you promote? African-American organization, mainly African-American participants, how do you build in the cultural aspect into your arts education and performances? Well, we, we first, from the perspective of arts instruction, um, it's, there's a very strong um, education basis there that, that children the children are exposed now, to. Now, is that formal classroom education, Absolutely. like you Absolutely. tell them who Romare Bearden was and um, Absolutely. Uh, Oswald Tanner and people like that, and have them actually look at their works and interpret them, or do you let them explore by their own research in terms of where black artists were, where Pippin was, and no, so I on? Think, How do you I, do I, that? It's, it's both. I mean, we, we one, want to make sure that the, that the uh, students gain a, an exposure to not just the classics, as in you know classical music and dance and 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 um, you know the the classics as in the Michelangelo's and 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 the like in in the visual arts department and the Shakespeare in the theater department, but we also expose them to African dance. Mm -hmm. um, we expose them to salsa and merengue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the dance department and in the in the music department, we have a very strong jazz studies program. Uh, most of our faculty who teach in the jazz, you know, who teach jazz uh, music classes are actually performing artists and mm -hmm. professional musicians. So oftentimes, you know, on a Monday night, you'll find Marcus Persiani and others at Lennox Lounge. You run, go down the street to Minton's, you'll find some of the other HSA faculty there. You turn the corner, go to Showman's, you'll pretty much find somebody there too. So. It's not just an exposure to the traditional forms of learning, but also uh, we feel very, very strongly that it is so important while we still have the opportunity for our children to learn from those who actually made history, you know, who mm -hmm. were there, who played with, mm -hmm. with Dizzy Gillespie, who played with Miles Davis, you know, who were there with, with an Osawa with Tanner, who were there with, um, you know, with when even we've been exposed to the dance theater master, M Mr. Mitchell himself, and, and, and also, you know, who were there, you know, back in the days when some of the, the, the best theater to come out of, of our community was coming out of, out of Harlem. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not just uh, the learning the skills, but it's also learning the role that those people played in history and mm -hmm. also learning an appreciation for 
how much they contributed so that we could be able to do what we do today. Now, if I'm watching a show and I'm a teacher at a school in Harlem or close by, how would I get involved in your program? Oh, it's very easy. You can walk over <laughs> and just walk in, or certainly through the website, you can get a lot of information what is the about website? the school. It's www.harlemschooloftheartsorg, and then also you can just call 212-926-4100. Do that again slowly. 212-926-4100, extension 305. Oh, very good. Yes, and extension 303. And um, and I would say that it's important for people to know that the Home School of the Arts, while we are an arts education institution, we also offer an endless roster of public programs. Mm -hmm. And most of our public programs are free. Mm -hmm. uh, we spend a lot of time trying to fundraise for those programs because now more than ever, there are so few opportunities for families to be able to enjoy mm -hmm. culture and to for, for families to enjoy artistic programming in our community, and, um, and and programming that's really geared to a family audience. I, you know, I tell people all the time, north of 110th Street, there really isn't that much um, besides you know Disney movies on 125th Street and and um, you know another institution that shall remain well, unnamed. I'd say south of 110th Street is much either if you don't have any money. Well, there you it's go. Okay. And, and this <laughs> is this is why. We work so hard to offer the free public programming. We have, we have a range of programs Give during the school year. Give an example of year. a couple of the recent programs. Sure, we have um, we have the Saturdays at Noon program, which is a program that you could find. You could have, um, you could you could be a part of a, a free dance performance. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll use the example of our resident dance company, the Nine Chen Dance Company. Um, it now, might what be is a, that, the dance company? Ninety Chen Dance Company is um, People who are 90 years old and people who are 10? No, 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 <laughs> Ninety Chen is an Asian American dance company. <laughs> and um, there are, are, there are th our dance company in residence and um, they may be uh, doing a performance there. Um, we have a lot of musical performances. We have, uh, com we have children's theater, uh, puppet shows, we have mm -hmm. storytelling. Um, but the vast uh, majority of our programs are not necessarily just geared to, for children. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, um, you know, that's sort of the, the, the best kept secret aspect of the Harlem School of the Arts. I mean, most people think that it's just children. And it's not that you best kept secret on the internet, because those of us who get to <laughs> Harlem School of the Arts <laughs> get it almost every week. But there you go. What your new programs there are. There you go. Then we also have a new series that we launched last fall called the um, Open Rehearsal Series. Mm -hmm. And this was our way of helping to support the musicians within our community, um, many of whom may not you know, be able to find, locate venues that they can rehearse in before upcoming performances, or for those of the, who are not even performing, um, to be able to keep, to keep those groups together and to be able to at least look forward to uh, having an opportunity to play with their, with their colleagues. And so the Open Rehearsal Series is an ongoing series and y y it runs the gamut. You, could, um, you can come in on a Thursday night, for example, and the calendars are on the website. Um, you can come in on Thursday night and Steve Akendo's 19-piece Latin jazz band may be playing with some of our students sitting in. Um, other days of the week, you could, it might be the Harlem Renaissance Orchestra, or it might be a chamber uh, music orchestra. We've had some new music, more contemporary uh, classical music. Um, there, you know, there's, it, there's just a broad range, and that program is also free of charge. Anyone can walk in and sit down and enjoy the music. Um, we, uh, we have a number of partnerships with other cultural organizations and arts organizations that are not necessarily from Harlem, but that want to bring some of their work to the Harlem community. Um, this week, for example, we have the Culture Project, which is the theater company that produced uh, Bridge and Tunnel, Sarah, uh, Sarah Jones's mm -hmm. pieces, as well as Anna Devere Smith's uh, pieces in the past. And they're offering um, from now through, I believe, the middle of June, uh, a jazz puppet show that's actually a show for adults as well as children um, twice a week and you know this is uh, one of the this is one of the ways that we're able to 
offer more to the community and be more relevant to the needs of the, of the community in times of, of extreme challenge now, and hardship. Physically, how is the Harlem School organized? I, I've been there, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a little about how physically it's organized so you can do all these different programs? Sure. I mean, we're a 47,000 square foot facility. Um, really occupy probably the equivalent of about a block and a half mm -hmm. um, in size. When you first walk into the um, into the building, you're in um, what we call the gathering space, which is uh, our primary performance space as well as our lobby area. And um, it's it was built really as an acoustically mm -hmm. um, oriented space for primarily for music performances. Uh, but we have all kinds of uh, programs there, uh, from lectures and seminars to music to theater. Um, on the when you go upstairs, that's when you um, you'll see the uh, private music studio, mm -hmm. music instruction studios, as well as the group class studios. Uh, downstairs on the north side, on the south side of the building, we have three professional sized dance studios, mm -hmm. and then on the north side, downstairs on the north side of the building, uh, downstairs are our visual arts studios, mm -hmm. and also we have a new state of the art computer lab in the visual arts de department, and then. Um, Upstairs are some of our administrative offices. Next door is our theater, which is a, a 110 seat black box theater, which is not only used for our purposes, such as student performances and, um, and the performances of our partner organizations, but um, we also offer that theater to community organizations or, or cultural organizations. Um, an example is uh, the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you know Garland. Um, they hold their programs there on Monday nights. Mm -hmm. um, we um, and then we we rent it as well at a very low, very very low fees mm -hmm. for artists and and um, arts institutions that want that don't have their own performance spaces, but who still want to continue to offer programming in. With Harvard. this great program and this building and staff and so on. Obviously, you need quite a bit of money, oh, particularly since many of them are free. Yeah. Uh, what is your financial base? How do you do your fundraising, et cetera? Nonstop. We do our fundraising all day, that's, every day. That's arts in America, that's nonstop. That's right. In, in but, our sleep, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, we, we actually, um, I'd say our, our funding base is uh, close to 30 percent is government funding. Um, New York State Council in the, the Arts. The Arts, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, the National Endowment for the Arts mm -hmm. and others. Um, and then uh, just over 25 percent or so is, is foundations, corporations, maybe about 15 percent, and then the rest are individuals. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we have an annual fundraising benefit uh, that we hold in March. And um, you know that's a, that's a program where we have our, our faculty student band perform, our HSA mm -hmm. alumni jazz band performs, and um, some of our students perform during the course of that evening. Um, we have in November um, the, the annual Radiothon, mm -hmm. uh, which is in partnership with WQXR, the classical music station, um, which is actually 25 years ongoing. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's a that's our second largest uh, fundraising event, uh, where WQXR gives us four hours of programming on the second Saturday of mm -hmm. the month in November uh, every year, and um, and we do an on-air uh, radiothon, and then it's um, it's just hunting them down and wrestling them to the ground. I mean that's. That's life in a nonprofit, isn't it? Well, the uh, <laughs> Harlem School of the Arts is well known in the community. Obviously, it is well supported, but it could be better supported. Now, if anyone who's watching wants to contact you about providing support or contacts, uh, how would they contact you? Um, they can they can call the school mm -hmm. uh, first of all, and that's two one two nine two six forty one hundred, and they should uh, call extension three twenty one for our development department. Um, but they can also just go on the website. And they can also just walk in the door one day that's right. with and a check. <laughs> that's right. And we, we have online giving on, mm -hmm. through our website. Um, mm -hmm. If someone wants to make a donation to the school, they can just go on to www.harlemschoolofthearts.org and they can make a, do a donation of any amount. Mm -hmm. um, and they can make multiple donations if they like. Now, you've done all this great work for these 40-some years. Who are some of your most prominent and successful alumni and alumna? Well, I'd, I'd have to say um, 
Giancarlo Esposito, mm -hmm. uh, the actor, is one of our alumni, mm -hmm. and we just reconnected with him recently, um, only to find out that his brother, too, is a, is a concert violinist who grew up at the Harlem School of the Arts. And his was an inter interesting story because his mother was an opera singer. And so I guess that was the connection to uh, Dorothy Maynard and the Harlem School of the mm -hmm. Arts. Um, I, I don't know if you saw the uh, play Passing Strange mm -hmm. last year, uh, but Deadre Aziza, who won the Tony Award for Passing Strange, is the Harlem School of the Arts alumni. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the list is endless. I mean, we can go back into the generations. That's a good point. Yes. Do most of the uh, participants become professional artists? Or do they continue their art as a volunteer, as an aficionado, as a supporter? I think that's really the most important thing about the Harlem School of the Arts is that while the vast majority of our students do not go on to become professional artists. Which is true of most performing arts schools, right. actually. But they do, through the discipline and the focus that they learn, you mm -hmm. know, through studying the arts, they do go on to become professionals. Mm -hmm. And they go on to become great neighbors and, and mm -hmm. really good citizens and people who pass their love for the arts on to the next generation. And that's really the goal. Um, we have a college prep program at HSA mm -hmm. um, that, that students enter at the age of 12. Um, until they graduate from high school and, and go on to college. Now, what is what do they do in that college prep program? Well, it's an audition-based or portfolio review program, so you have to go before a panel and audition in one of the four disciplines, the music, dance, theater, and visual arts. And if you're accepted into the program, it really requires um, a commitment, a, a very significant commitment. Um, the average college prep student probably spends about two afternoons uh, during the week at HSA, and then they generally are there all day into the evening on Saturdays. And what are they doing while they're, they're there? They're in an intensive pre-professional arts program. So if they are, if they are in the visual arts program, for example, they'll be either focusing, they'll be studying painting or drawing or sculpture. Um, if they're in dance, they're going to be receiving a broad overview of uh, modern ballet, African, and then ultimately in jazz dance or they may be, they may be a college prep uh, TAP student. Um, they'll choose one area, but they'll be exposed to a broad mm -hmm. range of styles and you know, within mm -hmm. the discipline. And um, our students perform nonstop throughout the city. Uh, for example, our jazz band normally performs, especially in the fall, um, for all of the, for so many of the fundraisers, um, corporate events and the like. Um, so when all is said and done and it's time to apply to colleges, I mean, they're, they're pretty seasoned. They have a, a portfolio. They have not only a portfolio, mm. they know, you know what they need to wear, they know that when, mm. when to show up, they, they have a repertoire. Um, if they're theater, music, or dance, um, they, they'll ask how long their audition, you know, what they, well, how long the audition is and how they'll know how to prepare for it. Um, our music st students, uh, from the age of eight actually must take music theory mm -hmm. and uh, generally our kids test out of music theory by the time they go to college because they've spent pretty much their young adult life in, in music theory classes at HSA and uh, we're very very proud um, that we have an acceptance rate of that averages between 95 to 100 percent. Do you do uh, any academic tutoring as absolutely. well? Absolutely. Um, we've, we've had to increase that in recent years because we found that students um, are not necessarily receiving the academic supports that they should be receiving from their academic institutions and so we not only offer academic tutoring but we also are very involved in their college application process. Mm -hmm. um, we offer, you know, through partnerships, for example, the, um, and next fall we'll be offering financial literacy component through a partnership with another institution. Um, and we also have parents and staff who volunteer, you know, to work with them on, um, on their college essays to prepare uh, for, you know, their applications to college. How many students do you take in each year? Um, we usually have on average, I'd say uh, between 1,500 and 2,000 students per year mm -hmm. in the school. And um, in the college prep program, I'd say it ranges anywhere from, from it can range from 40 to, to, from 30 to about 75. Now, do the students pay for this? Yes, they do. Um, but like all community-based organizations, I mean, we're, we're trying to meet the needs of a, of a community that 
uh, generally is, is very uh, challenged economically. So we do offer financial aid. We have merit-based scholarships, work study, mm -hmm. um, and, and a host of, of ways that we can work with families to uh, ensure that they ca their kids can, can be a part of the this program. This must mean that you must talk with some of the other community-based organizations in Harlem, some of the churches, mm -hmm. places like the Y, the <coughs> Boys, uh, Boys Club, the Girls Club, Absolutely. because those are the kind of things that help to round out kids' lives. Absolutely, and um, we, we also um, are members of the National Guild of Community Schools. Mm -hmm. So um, we're not, you know, I'm, I'm constantly in discussions with, with our colleagues who are not, who are also not within our community, you know, to learn from what they're facing. And, and we really share um, a lot of our best practices or, you know, the methodologies that have worked for us to, to be able to be able to be more effective. But at the same time, I'd say that everyone right now is facing the same challenge. Well, the Harlem School of Art heard and has a lot of best practices. Today on African American Legends, we've been talking with Kakuna Karina, the president and CEO, and we've learned a lot about the Harlem School of Art. Thank you very much, Kakuna, for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me.